I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, outs, and nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... How a ragtag army of POW staged a revolution that saw the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the birth of Czechoslovakia, Part 3. Everyone knows those stories of World War I, World War II, the French Revolution, and all other classic historic wars taught to generations of kids in their high school history classes. But fewer know about the labyrinthian sequence of events that led to the formation of Czechoslovakia in the mid-1900s. It involved the fall of four empires, an underdog army of Czech and Slovak POWs banding together to trek 6,000 miles across the Siberian tundra, Indiana Jones-style adventure and intrigue, and the seizing, consolidating, and redistributing of power that still is having an effect on the world stage to this day. Act 5. Take Me Home, Country Roads. The Czechoslovak Legion's situation wasn't actually that good. See, controlling the Trans-Siberian meant that they didn't have much manpower at any one location, and supplies were low, especially ammunition. To compound this, morale and discipline collapsed as soon as they had control of the whole Trans-Siberian Railway, because that had been their only goal. They had no idea what was going to happen next. While the Entente was pushing them to hold their position, it wasn't getting them the support they'd need to do that. The French and British sent troops down from the northern Russian port of Archangel along with three American battalions sent because Woodrow Wilson mistakenly thought that they were only going to guard supply catches there. There were only a few thousand of them though, which left them incapable of providing any real help. Legion officers wrote to Masaryk and Beignets asking them to position Japan for more military aid. They got no results. Their allies in Russia weren't much better. While anti-Bolshevik forces were strong in Siberia, they were a random collection of everyone opposed to the Moscow Soviet, and many of them hated each other. These factions had coalesced into two forces, the People's Army, run by the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and the Russian Army, led by Alexander Kolchak. The Socialist Revolutionaries were the most popular in rural Russia, but leaders of the Russian Army were hardline monarchist holdouts who hated the whole political left regardless of whether they were for or against the Bolshevik government. The majority of the Czechoslovak legion supported the socialist revolutionaries, but they desperately wanted the two armies to work together to improve their chances against the Reds. Despite their appeals for cooperation, there was no movement towards unification for the White Army. Meanwhile, the Red Army was getting stronger. It started as a disorganized and inexperienced militia of civilians and poorly trained conscripts for the final days of the Imperial Russian Army, but under the guidance of Leon Trotsky, it was rising to the challenge of the Czechoslovak Legion. He ended the democratic election of officers by enlisted men and instituted a more standard, experience-based promotion system, replaced incompetent commanders, introduced mandatory military service, and began recruiting experienced officers from the old Tsarist army. We talked about this on the a lot in the first episode, um, which is funny because, you know... The first episode just sort of like covers, uh, you know, as the events start to unroll and as things start to, you know, come to a head. And now we're getting into like the really granular elements of like how this all transpired. And it, it now it's like clicking to me because we talked about how it's crazy how quickly the things changed for them and how effective they were at just within their own lifetimes, within a short amount of time, just like systematically reshaping the um the 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 government and the society of multiple countries um you know in Europe and Asia and now it, you know just reading this little part it it makes sense because there's like no red tape they can just they can just like implement sweeping changes to uh laws and infrastructure and it just happens. And the reason why things can't work that way, like in the modern times, is because like literally none of this stuff would ever get approved to happen. Like somebody being like, oh, I want to um, completely change from a, um, a voluntary uh, army with no like prerequisites for, you know, physical prowess or experience to becoming a draft only army that uh has like prerequisites of like a certain level experience and then just did it um and you there's 
you if you tried to make any kind of change at that scale, you would be tied up in like gridlock and infighting for like a decade, you know? Yeah, the other thing that's fascinating about this too is the ambition of it, right? Like so much of this, you know, like you're saying, there's not as much red tape, sure. But it also, because there's no red tape, it almost kind of feels like it's even less likely to happen because it that's, that's not how we do it here. You know, it's just like internalized dogma. And the, for the fact that these all, all these guys just got together and were like, nah, we're going to go over here now is like kind of even more admiral, admirable on a, on a different level, like on an existential level of like, oh, wow, they could see the code in the Matrix. And they were like, fuck this, we're going over here. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and now, like, unfortunately, a lot of that energy is poured into academic discussions of things. Like there's just a lot of people on TikTok talking about like revolutionary action and all of that energy goes into that like communal based discussion of it of like somebody being like this is the right way of revolution and then somebody being like actually no that's actually not the right way of revolution it's actually like this and then somebody being like yeah i agree with part of that but then like this part is actually not correct and then it should be this way and then it's just that it's just that forever and and, and Masaryk and Benyes they were just like let's get on a fucking train and fucking do this shit bitches yeah, what's the uh, what's the what's the code phrase that you think they all had? Like, you know that they must have had just like some sort of in joke where it's just like train life hashtag train life. And then they all just like got on the train together. Like, you know that there's some weird. No, the 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 day that they the 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 the, the passcode for the day that they knew that it was on. Masaryk just walked in the room and he said, "Avatar Two: The Way of the Water." <laughs> they knew it was time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's one of those it's one of those uh, call and response, you know, like uh, the sun is shining, but the ice is slippery spy phrases. So it's Avatar 2, the way of the water. And then you respond with, but James Cameron will make us all believe. And they got on the train and they were just like, I don't know what that meant, but like we're doing this shit. Get that printing press ready. Get it warmed up, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cut to a couple or a year ago or whatever it was, the great great grandchild of of uh, Doctor or Professor Masaryk. He just sees that sees a commercial and he's just like, <gasps> the prophecy. To cap it all off, he began to travel Russia in a special armored train equipped with two engines, an electrical generator, machine guns, a personal library, a bath, telephones, and a personal bodyguard of fifty Bolshevik soldiers in black leather jackets. For two years, he lived out of his mobile command post, visiting different regions, resolving political crises, dispensing supplies, offering advice, and stumping for the communist cause. I I mentioned last episode that I just didn't know that there was, like, such thing as train battles. Like, I just didn't know that was a thing. And uh, the the, um, it's funny because we we decided to split the, the episode into three instead of two episodes, and so we actually got to see, like, discussion around that. The second episode, you know, before recording this, and some people in our Discord were like, yeah, of course there was train battles. Like it's a it's like a historical thing, and blah, 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 blah. And they shared some like links to some Wikipedia articles and stuff like that. Um, and once again, I'll just say like what was just described is armored train with machine. Like this is like wild, wild west. Like I, I didn't know that I didn't know this was a thing that was real. Like, you know, in, I mean, the it, you know how in the movie they have that train that's like a fucking tricked out train with like secret trap doors and machine guns. I mean, and it's shit. not just it's not just the movie. Also, the TV show that was the train they hung out on in the TV show. I I, I thought that was a fictional thing that never existed. It was like crazy armored trains from. I mean, this was this was earlier than that. That you know the Wild Wild West took place in the 1800s, and this is the this you know this no well this I guess this is after that. So yeah, but still, I I yeah, still nineteen. This is night. We're 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 up to nineteen twenty something. I think, um, no, nineteen eighteen. Uh, even then, I didn't know that this was like a thing that was technologically possible. So th- so this 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 sounds like science fiction or it's like steampunk shit to me. I was not familiar with train battles either. It's not just you. The new Red Army was bad news, and by late nineteen eighteen, Legion was getting pushed further and further east. They could either leave Russia or die defending it. And that choice wouldn't be made by them. It would be made by whoever could get them ships, and it looked like the Entente wasn't planning to do that. The Legion did have a few things going for it, though. During a battle at the city of Kazan in August, Legionnaires had captured a cache of Imperial Russian gold that was about half of the country's total reserve. It was worth roughly $332 million. Over time, Admiral Kolchak's government would spend about a third of this, but small amounts mysteriously disappeared. 
probably into the pockets of enterprising legionnaires. Admiral Kolchak, you say? Was he a night stalker? It's funny because we've already mentioned Admiral Kolchak, and I thought you would say something and you didn't. Yeah, I feel like that's because was the well, the previous time we talked about him, it was like really late at night, right? Because it did it did ring a bell, but I was just like, I'm tired. Let's get this over with. <laughs> yeah, he's the he's the he's the ancestor of of Kolchak the Night Stalker. The other big thing was the Entente's diplomatic recognition of Czechoslovakia. Professor Masaryk and Dr. Beignets were still tirelessly fighting for foreign support for Czechoslovakian independence, and they were slowly starting to get it. By June 3rd of 1918, France, Italy, and Britain had recognized their national council as the supreme organization of the Czechoslovak movement in Entente countries. The USA was slower to agree, which led Professor Masaryk to send this letter to President Wilson. I think that this recognition has become practically necessary. I dispose of three armies in Russia, France, and Italy. I am at wit's end, the master of Siberia and half Russia, and yet I am in the United States formally as a private man. We have an army, the most essential attribute of sovereignty according to the international views not having a territory, yet the French Republic, by her recognition, has solved the problem and created a precedent. I hope that the United States will join France. You had me at France, which was the f last word in your statement, so you act it actually took the full thing that you said to convince me, but my point is, is that France is the, is the father of the long bread. So that's all you had to say. All you had to say was France. You could have sent me a letter that just said France. You could have typed it up on your little train newspaper machine and sent it by carrier pigeon, and I would have joined in because of the long breaths. Look at this. Look at this face I'm making right now. Look at this mouth. This mouth wants a long bread in it, right? So I just need you to give me the France with the long breaths. Okay? Okay. See you soon. Now, if you were trying to get me to to join in with Italy or Greece or whatever, uh, I would say no, because that's the land of the Shabada. I'm not sure if it's Italy or Greece. I don't know which one the Shabada is from, but I just, as a, as a rule, just to be safe, I, I, I do not fuck with either country. I don't know what it is, but whenever you say Shabada in that accent, I just get irrationally happy. I, I don't know what that is, but I, I love it when you say Shabada. Also, somebody in, somebody in the Discord said that Woodrow Wilson sounded a little, a little bit like a Bill Cosby. Uh, I don't hear it. No, it's, it's, it's Woodrow all the way through. On September 3rd, the U.S. government recognized the National Council as a sovereign government and sent them a loan of $7 million. His immediate goals met, Masaryk started drafting a Czechoslovak Declaration of Independence. Listen, here's $7 million. The only thing I ask is for a diplomatic presidential gift of a boatload of long breads sent over across the sea. The best news for the Legion, though, was that the Entente had won World War I. The German Chancellor appealed for peace on October 1st of 1918, and Austria-Hungary did the same day, because Germany essentially controlled their army at this point in the war. The current Emperor of Austria-Hungary, young Karl I, had taken the position after Emperor Franz Joseph I died from the exhaustion of managing a failing country back in 1916. A few hours before he died, he said, I still have much to do. I must get on with my work. Karl was desperate to keep the empire together and to placate independence movements. He created a federalization manifesto which would turn the empire into a league of autonomous provinces. Beignets and Masaryk were terrified a peace settlement would use this instead of their plan for total independence. So over the course of several days, Masaryk and a group of advisors drafted a declaration of independence in various hotel rooms and apartments across Washington, D.C. On October 16th of 1918, Masaryk sent an assistant to the hotel room of Herbert Miller, a national tea specialist from Oberlin College. The aide handed him a stack of papers and said this. This is the Czechoslovak Declaration of Independence. The professor wants you to put it into English. Miller thought the Declaration of Independence would not appeal to the American public in its current form and decided to give it some rewrites. Luckily, two of his friends happened to be walking by while he was sitting on a park bench reading the thing and offered to help. These were noted sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who had let Milan Stefanik use his estate as a military training camp, and Charles W. Nichols, an employee of the American Agricultural Association. Can you imagine if you, I was like sitting in a park one day, and you just like happened by, and you were like, oh, Spandrew. 
And and I was like, oh yeah, what what up, yo? And you're like, what what are you doing there? And I'm like, um, drafting uh, a translation of the Declaration of Independence for a newly formed nation state that's coming into its own based on a uh, a, a, a a content wide civil war. And you were just like, huh? Well, I mean, if I, if you need any help, let me know. The funny thing, too, is that he took it on himself to edit it. Like, that would be so nerve-wracking. Like, I was really nervous about that for the French edition of my book because I was like, I don't speak French. I don't know what these words are. Like, they could have just completely rewritten everything, and I wouldn't know. Uh, and they did have to rewrite a lot because translation, you kind of have to, like, localize things. So are there, all, there are all these jokes and names of things that don't translate one-to-one. Um, and so I would be so scared if I was writing a legal document and some other person was translating it, that it would be just like the meaning of it would be lost completely, you know? Yeah. In, in, um, in, in France, Mary Tyler Moorhawk's name is Le Petit Tintin. <laughs> well, like in, in the French edition, uh, all of the girls in Forest Hills bootleg society, they like, they hang out at this burger chain which is a it's the same burger chain that's in all of our books uh called shiver me burgers and it's like a it's like a the joke is it's like long john silver so it's like pirate themed burgers or whatever and in the french edition is the name of the restaurant the name of the restaurant is a burger a burger which i guess translates to burger is the same word over there but in french pirates instead of saying like yo ho yo ho bottle rum their catchphrase is like abordage, which basically means like heave ho or something. So they they turned it into abordage, um, which is a pretty good translation joke. Like that that is equivalent and that makes sense. Um, but not knowing any of that stuff and not, you know, now I know the translator and we've had all these conversations about stuff. Um, but n- n- at the time I was like, I don't know this person. I hope they fucking get our book. American comic uh, creators release nazi manifesto in in france you never know right like you you have to trust that these people are going to honor the authorial spirit of the thing you're doing but you don't really have any control over it you just kind of have to go well we'll fucking see yeah which is which is uh i mean it's it's i mean it's still an issue obviously because you just said you just dealt with it but it's like like at at the end of the day, like the worst case scenario is you could just sit and like line by line plug it into just like a basic Google Translate and just get a general idea of like you wouldn't you you wouldn't get a proper translation, but you would get like an idea of what it was kind of saying, you know. Or you could like go on Upwork and just like hire somebody to call you and fucking translate it for you and just tell you what it says or something like that. But like that was always a big problem with nationalization of anime and video games. I'm sure other things, but just anime and video games specifically are what I'm kind of aware of in manga, where like what you're saying, where there was all this nationalization going on, but because the, uh, you know, lack of globalization between the two countries, they really were just kind of like trusting that they were just translating it. They really didn't know what they were being translated as. And so there are like translation, like older translations of anime and video games where like they just did weird shit where they just took stuff and they were just like, I don't exactly, I have no idea what that, how you would translate that from Japanese. So I'm just going to make up this other weird thing. And then they fill in like little gaps with like random shit. And it's very based on the personality of the nationalization, nationalization translator person. And sometimes, you know, the original creators were not happy with the changes that they made once they, like, found out what they were, you know. But at the time, they didn't know. And it would be even crazier back then in the, you know, in the, 19, in the, late, 19, uh, the 19, late 1910s where you're just like and – it, and it's a fucking – it's a declaration of independence. So you're just like, we've got to have this translated not only to, like, maintain the integrity or the meaning of the original document but also have it, like, translated in a way that would get, like, American people on board with it. So I can see why he's like, I'm doing this shit myself. They got a group together and holed up in Nichols' office with a few other writers and edited the Czechoslovak Declaration of Independence by physically cutting up the manuscript and pasting it back together. They did this from 7.30 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. the next day, then sent it back to Masaryk for final revisions. So they they naked lunched it. They just, they, they, the, the Czechoslovakian, uh, Declaration of Independence is just, is just like an avant-garde, 
uh, beat novel. They're writing it, and Masterick's like, you guys ever heard of this guy, Burroughs? I mean, I hear he, like, killed his wife or whatever, but, like, don't even worry about that. After they did this, he just that. went and shot his wife. Masterick sent copies to every Entente leader. The copy sent to Woodrow Wilson came with this note attached. The National Council was compelled to make this declaration now because of the Austrian moves for peace and toward a mock federation calculated to deceive the world. I don't know much about Austria, but I do, I'm pretty sure that their bread isn't particularly long, so... You have my my axe and my sword and my bow and those little sticks that the hobbits have. Yes, all bread, the greatest building material in God's universe. On October 19th, Wilson had his Secretary of State send a message to Karl Habsburg, which argued that since the National Council was in a state of war with Austria-Hungary and the USA had recognized the authority of the National Council, the president is, therefore, no longer at liberty to accept the mere autonomy of these peoples as the basis for peace, but is obliged to insist that they, and not he, shall be the judges of what the action of the people of the Austro-Hungarian government will satisfy in their aspirations and their conception of their rights and destiny as members of the family of nations. The new free press, the empire's top newspaper, responded with an editorial that said this. Austria-Hungary has a new premier whose seat is in Washington. His name is Wilson. Really? I gotta meet this Wilson guy. I've never met a premier before. I'm really excited to meet him. I feel like, where is he at? He's supposed to be here. They said he was in Washington. <laughs> It's actually not good to like make him so make him so uh uh charming and like charismatic because he was like a terrible person. Yeah, he was a terrible fucking person. But on our in our universe, he's like really cute. Yeah, in our universe, he's just like a delightful uh he's like a delightful, like uh, charismatic fool. He's cute, he's kind of drunk, and he loves bread. <laughs> actively retconning like whitewashing history <laughs> we're wilson washing it full full wilson full wilson wash come on down to wilson wash i'll personally squeegee up the dirt on the hood of your car with some long breads the austro-hungarian collapse had already begun on october 14th czechs began a general strike to end the shipment of their dwindling food supplies to vienna on the 17th, Dr. Beignets sent Czech community leaders in Prague a letter announcing the National Council's provisional government and offering to cooperate with them provided Professor Masaryk got a high position in whatever new government they formed. An agreement from Prague authorized the National Council to conduct international diplomacy on behalf of Bohemia. The German speakers of Austria proper felt betrayed by Karl's federalization manifesto and declared the Republic of German Austria at the end of October 1918. The Hungarian government claimed that federalization was a violation of the agreement that had created an Austro-Hungarian union in the first place and seceded from the empire in November. In December, the Yugoslav movement declared the independence of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slavonese with the intent to unify with Serbia. Gavrilo Princip had finally gotten what he wanted. 2.1 million Austro-Hungarian citizens were killed in World War I or had died as a result of it. The Empire's officer corps was decimated, leaving the army rudderless and continued military rule impossible. On Halloween 1918, Karl formally released all surviving officers from their oaths of loyalty to the House of Habsburg and permitted them to join the armies of their new nations. The Austro-Hungarian military standard flew for the last time on November 21st. The Austro-Hungarian military standard flew for the last time on November 21st over a little unit in central Albania, unaware the war had ended. Karl Habsburg, his imperial and royal apostolic majesty, the emperor of Austria, apostolic king of Hungary and Croatia, Slavonia and Dalmatia, was holed up with his family in a palace in Vienna, guarded by two platoons of officer cadets who had volunteered to guard him. After they found out that Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm had fled to the Netherlands, his aides warned him that he was in danger unless he abdicated. So, on November 11th, he declared, The people, through its representatives, have taken over the government. I renounce all participation in the affairs of state. With victory at hand, Dr. Edvard Beignets, whom the imperial authorities had thrown in jail for her husband's revolutionary activities. I heard how much you suffered, how bad it was. I had felt that it would be so. When I return, you will tell me everything, explain everything. You can now clearly understand that this was not in vain. Listen, you 
rotted in a in a jail cell for my crimes against the state. You took one for the team. But look now, some like lines on a map are just different. It was worth it. <laughs> That's got to be so rough on both sides of that, though. Like it's I can't imagine the guilt of asking or uh, knowing that someone else is suffering for that cause. And I and I can't imagine being in the position where, you know, you are you are the spouse of someone who's engaging in these activities and you are punished in this way. And you're like, bro, I don't even know where he is. Why am I here? I don't know. I don't know. That's the other reason why these things don't happen anymore. Why revolutionary action can't, you know, occur and be so expedited. My, my wife would never go to jail so that I could form my own nation state. N- never in a million years. Here's the thing, though. It wouldn't it wouldn't be your wife that gets thrown in jail. It would be me. Well, you 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 would you would. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I'd, I'd suffer for you. Yeah, I'd be like, Dave, I'm trying I'm trying to make Spicelvania. <laughs> Dave. Do you want Castle Baconstein <laughs> to exist in the capital of Spicelvania? Like, come on. You gotta take one for the team. This is this is this is this is bigger than us. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than us, bro. Just go to prison for like five years, get tortured and assaulted, and then at the end of it, you get Castle Baconstein. And I'm like, you're like visiting me in prison. And I'm like, my face is swollen up and there's blood caked all over it. And I'm like, my one lens out of my glasses is gone. So I can only see out of one eye. And I'm like, can it be Castle Davenstein instead? You like caress my cheek. And you're like, okay. The wheels are already in motion, baby. We already, we, we already got the, 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 the contract signed. Yeah, man. If there was a, if there was a castle at the end of it, I'd, I'd, I'd be down to get tortured for a while. <laughs> this is bigger than us, Dave. Just a little bit longer and Spicelvania will be, will be realized. Spicelvania will be free. <laughs> Think of the rolling hills and the trees with eye patches on them. Every, eye patches for as far as the one eye can see. I can see it. I can see it. Rest now, Davy boy. Rest now. And look, I can see I can see that one of your eyes is infected and you'll probably lose it, but that's good. Now you can fully assimilate into Spicelvania. You can be like all of us. I want it. I think I'm strong enough, but I don't know. And besides, I mean, the food in here has got to be better than that shit that you eat in your regular home. I miss rice. <laughs> you you miss you miss just boiled rice with nothing in it. <laughs> Like you're just like, and it's weird because I I I thought that like we would get served rice like that seems like prison food and it's like no I I told them specifically not to give you rice because I was just like he needs he needs to be cut off. How could you? Just a little bit longer. Just a little bit longer. Spicelvania. Where is it? Where incidentally the very first law on the on the constitution is that rice is illegal nationwide this is going to be such a betrayal man this is going to be (laughs) such a betrayal i'm going to have sacrificed all of this for you and you're taking away rice on the subject of their victory he'd later say that he couldn't believe it was really happening i mean me too he's having the same reaction i have to this story he's like this shit is surreal the actual transfer of power from the empire to czechoslovakia was pretty simple There were minor skirmishes with Imperial soldiers stationed in Prague, but the Czechs cut telegraph lines so they couldn't receive new orders and used the time they had just bought to convince them to leave Prague and join the armies of their newly independent home countries. The Imperial governor of Prague rang the phone number of the Czech National Committee's hideout, which he had known the whole time, and handed over his Imperial seals and keys. The civil servants didn't even leave their desks between governments. While a new revolutionary national assembly met in Prague to decide what to do with their new country, a Slovak-American activist named Joseph Husek took some of the exile's earlier documents, which had been written in pencil, and reprinted them with new calligraphy to make the policies they had come up with on the spot seem important and legally binding. Yeah, just draw a little, just draw a little, just draw a little circle there. Just a little, little, uh, little squiggle on that eye right there. No one's gonna know. This isn't just some random made-up shit that somebody wrote out of their fucking mind, just improving. When Masaryk boarded a ship from New York to return to Prague, where for the first time in four years he wouldn't be a wanted man, he found a detachment of American sailors waiting for him. His first military honor guard. 
He later said this was when he realized he had ceased to be a private individual. Yeah, just, that was the first time I ever realized, holy shit, I've, I'm a badass. I'm a baddie. I'm out here in these streets making new nation states. Yeah, from, from a humble Czech professor to bad bitch. And all it took was a, was a train war. It was on that ship crossing the Atlantic when he said he first thought to himself, dear God, we've actually done it. They may have done it, but things in Russia were still looking bleak. In the words of Gustav Bekvar, still alive after all this time, filled with indignation and bitter disappointment, the legionnaires lost the last of their enthusiasm for the anti-Bolshevik cause. They had been fighting the Red Army constantly along the Volga River. They were running out of ammo, food, medicine, and winter clothing. Large numbers of soldiers were refusing to fight. Unable to cope with the situation, one Colonel Svek went to his train car and shot himself in the head. That Colonel Svek was like, I'm not a bad bitch. Meanwhile, Admiral Kolchak had orchestrated a coup to install himself as supreme ruler and commander in chief of all Russian land and sea forces. <laughs> that's, some, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I would do. If if I if I toppled uh, an empire and then like installed myself as like the, the it's like some supreme leader, I'd be like, I am now officially Spandrew Spice, ultimate super duper badass cool guy, awesome, whip your ass and f take some names. Basically, I'm John McClane mixed with fucking. Uh, Goku from Dragon Ball Z of Spicelvania. And then everyone in the giant crowd standing in front of you kneels, and then you just hear, Hail Spice! Hail Spice! The Legion had no interest in fighting the Bolshevik dictatorship just to prop up an anti-Bolshevik dictatorship. Besides, they had already won in the West. They had a homeland to go back to and wouldn't be executed as traitors anymore. By December of 1928, they had pulled away from the Volga, and were heading back east. The Entente sent Stefanik to Siberia to assess the situation, despite the fact that he was still suffering from injuries sustained during the war. A soldier named Frantisek Kosi said, Stefanik talked to them like a brother, like a soldier, like a minister and a politician. He talked to them for four hours, ignoring his fatigue, often fainting from exhaustion. He was pleading, begging, demanding, and appealing to the feelings of the soldiers, so much so that he had begun to cry. That doesn't sound cool. That doesn't sound admirable. That sounds like a hot mess. He's up there just fainting and crying, and then just his eyes rolling into his back of his head and just fainting. He's like trust falling. Yeah. Like he's like playing it off. He's like, I didn't faint. I didn't faint. That was, a, that was a trust fall. That was a trust fall. There was something in my eye. So you fell? The orders he had been told to give were grim, though. He struggled to say it, but the Entente wanted them to hold the line in Russia until either the Bolsheviks were crushed or they were all dead. In his own words, It is useless to discuss the rights and wrongs of the case. The fact of importance is that help will not come. Now you know just how things stand, and also the extent of the task that lies ahead. When Stefanik left Siberia to go be Minister of War for the new Czechoslovak Republic, he had no illusions that he had improved morale. He said what he had been told was the Legion's new mission, and the mission was bad. His speeches caused two more battalions to refuse to go to the front, and according to Bekvar, they led another officer to shoot himself. The reprieve finally came in January 1919, when Stefanik and General Janin who commanded the Czechoslovaks in their capacity as part of the French Foreign Legion, sent out an order that the legionnaires would pull back from the front lines and rebase around the eastern part of the Trans-Siberian Railway. At the city of Omsk, they had a big lunch and met Janine, who had come to supervise their defense of the railway. At the event, a legionnaire yelled, So the Allied help has come at last by lending us a fat general without troops. Damn, fucking roasted. He's just out here just being like, body shamed. In April of 1919, the Red Army began to advance and the White Army began to collapse. Dr. Beignets, Czechoslovakia's first foreign minister, sent out a plea to the Entente, urging them to help evacuate the Legion on the grounds that it was becoming the Republic's first political crisis. In September of 1919, the U.S. government loaned Czechoslovakia another $12 million to cover costs and sent out enough ships to transport 55,000 people, and the U.K. responded in kind. Listen, I'll give you $12 million more, but that's it. You're cut off. And the only reason why I'm even doing this is because you gave me so many long breads in that ship, so I, I feel like I still owe you, but this is it. But that's a whole other story. 
12 million dollars in 1919 money is an exorbitant amount of money though like that was back when you could buy like a meal with like a dime this is the sole reason why the u.s government is in like seven trillion dollars of debt it's just it's just all from this the day that woodrow wilson gave czechoslovakia 12 million dollars yeah, it's just compounded interest over the ensuing 100 years. In October, the Legion began its retreat from Omsk to Vladivostok. Temperatures ranged from 10 to 15 degrees below freezing, and the railway was covered in snow. Kolchak decided that this was probably also a good time for him to leave and take the remaining $210 million in gold with him. This is, this is the last known photo of Admiral Kolchak. And he actually kind of does look like the Night, night Stalker. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be honest. Yeah, he kind of, you know you know what he looks like? He looks like, he looks like um, the before photo in a vampire movie. You know, it's like, this was the only known photo of Count Schwageslag. Now he's known as the wretch of the Eastern Hills. And it's this guy, like 100% this dude. Yeah, he looks like a, a Pixar version of a Russian guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Pixar version of uh, a Russian man with a dark secret. The Legion's orders were to leave before Admiral Kolchak did, which meant that they took the trains in front of Kolchak's group, which meant Kolchak blamed them for stopping him from evacuating fast enough. He even threatened to trap them by blowing up the Lake Baikal Railroad Tunnel, like the Red Army wanted to do. To top it all off, the Red Army was gaining on them. On January 5th, 1920, the Legionnaires received orders to place Kolchak on a Legion-controlled train and seize the gold. He agreed because the Legion were the only troops that could protect him at this point. Locals protested Kolchak in every town the train passed through. At one stop, railway workers would only let them pass after the Legion agreed to let four armed Russian guards occupy Kolchak's train. At one stop, railway workers would only let them pass after the Legion agreed to let four armed Russian guards occupy Kolchak's train car. On January 6th, Kolchak sent his resignation as Supreme Ruler and Commander-in-Chief of all Russian land and sea forces to General Janine. Eight days later, at a train station in Irkutsk, a group of Reds demanded the Admiral surrender to them. At 6 p.m. on January 15th, two of the Legion's officers entered Kolchak's train car and told him they were under orders to hand him over to the Socialist Revolutionary Government of Irkutsk. So the Allies are betraying me, he asked, and calmly let them take him away. Socialist revolutionaries interrogated Kolchak and his prime minister at a local prison until they passed control of the city to a Bolshevik Soviet. Afraid advancing White Army remnants would try to free them, the Bolsheviks executed both in February. The Legion left the gold behind in Irkutsk as a bribe to keep the Bolsheviks off their backs. As in all great adventure stories, you can never take the treasure home. The last Legionnaires arrived in Vladivostok in May. After about a month, Allied ships started arriving to take them home. Masaryk estimated 4,500 Legionnaires died during the war. An officer in the Russian Railway Service Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Johnson, a man known for supporting the Bolsheviks, gave the Legion this assessment. Brown, hardened trench fighters, undoubtedly the greatest fighting men in the world. Some soldiers, these boys. Their young, boyish faces, so serious, so courteous, it has been a pleasure to know them. My admiration for them exceeds my power of language. While they do not in the slightest degree strut or put on airs, they are the most self-confident bunch of men I have ever seen. Each of us stared at the Russian landscape which we were leaving forever. Sad thoughts overwhelmed us. We felt sorry and grateful, happy and sad. A strange foreboding fell over us. What would it look like at home? Shall we see all of those we left behind? We had spent so many years away as drifters. What shall we do with our broken limbs and frayed nerves? How did I get here? That is the main question of history. The logical follow-up is, where am I going? The story of the Czechoslovak Legion is a story about the birth of modern Europe. It's a story about the move from the last vestiges of feudal monarchy to the modern nation-state. But it's also a story about a number of small European countries and a bunch of different people. Let's give them some conclusions. Czechoslovakia mostly managed to avoid the instability and ethnic violence that plagued the other new states formed after World War I. Amidst the post-war strife, it stood as a rich industrial nation with a strong social safety net and high personal liberty. By 1933, it was the only republic in Europe east of the Rhine. Professor Masaryk reconnected with his wife Charlotte when he came back to Prague. He visited her in the sanitarium she had been interned in for the first day he spent there. And when he became the first president of Czechoslovakia, they moved together into the Habsburg castle that now served as the presidential palace. She lived until 1923, and Masaryk died in 1937, two years after stepping down from the presidency. I did it. I did all of it for some of that sweet, sweet 
American. Uh, yeah. What? This is a family show, Dave. Yeah, yeah. That's fa- that's where you're stopping. Yeah. All right, booty cheeks. Okay, booty <laughs> cheeks. Edward Benes stayed in politics alongside Masaryk and got elected president after him. Unfortunately, this meant he was president when the Nazis invaded. He fled to London and worked with the resistance. After the war ended, he returned to the country and died there in 1948. You, like, spent the better part of a decade fighting this, like, uh, country, like multi-country war to establish independence for your people. And then, like, a couple years later, the fucking Nazis, uh, you know, attack Europe. Less than ideal, I think, would be one way to describe that. Yeah, Le- less than ideal. I mean, less. I I would give up. Lesser men would be like, "Fuck this! I'm not doing this shit again." That's not true. You remain committed to Spicelvania. Come on. I defend Sp- Spicelvania from Hitler. Get the fuck out of Spicelvania, Hitler, and take your shitty little paintings with you. Milan R. Stefanik died in 1919 while flying a biplane from Italy to Czechoslovakia. The most common explanation of the crash was mechanical failure, but there was an ongoing border skirmish between Hungary and Czechoslovakia at the time, and a competing theory has the Czechoslovak army mistaking the red, white, and green Italian markings on his plane for red, white, and green Hungarian markings and shooting him down. Karl Habsburg died in exile in 1922. His son Otto became a symbol for Austrian resistance to Nazism during World War II, with the idea of the old multi-ethnic empire's independence opposed to the Nazis' pan-Germanic nationalism. He was heavily involved with resistance movements, and it's estimated he helped 15,000 Austrians flee Nazi authorities. Leon Trotsky was deported from the Soviet Union in 1929 due to an increasingly dangerous feud with Joseph Stalin. He was assassinated in Mexico in 1940 by a Soviet agent with an ice axe. With an ice axe, Dave. What the fuck? A former Soviet military leader was assassinated in Mexico by a secret agent with an ice axe. What have you done with your life? Yeah, 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 it's a good question. It's a good question. Pre-order Mary Tyler Moorhawk now wherever books are sold. And get assassinated with an ice axe. I might get assassinated. Please pre-order the book now before I die. (laughs) I'm going to assassinate Dave with an ice axe. It's the perfect crime because the axe melts. And then it's like, how'd this guy die? Is that what that means? I assumed that was like an ice pick, like a little pick axe thing that you go to get ice out of like an ice. No, Dave. It's an axe made of ice. No, it, it probably is an axe that's used to cut ice. But I want it to be an axe made of ice. Gustav Bekvar would go on to write a memoir of his time in the war called The Lost Legion, a Czechoslovakian epic. A white army officer named Konstantin W. Sakharo wrote a book called The Czech Legions in Siberia. He refused to acknowledge that the Czechoslovak Legion lacked the supplies to keep fighting the Bolsheviks and framed the whole story as the Legion acting like they were going to save Russia from the Reds, plundering everything, and then leaving. He presented Colonel Svek as one of the few honorable legionnaires who killed himself out of shame for the evil of the Legion, and Stefanik as a rogue element assassinated by the Czechoslovak government to cut off a dangerous loose end. Dang, all these guys were, like, capitalizing on this for book deals. Yeah, and we thought it was just a modern thing for people to withhold vital political information and under, uh, undermine democracy for own personal gain. Nah, they were... They were, they were they were they were exploiting this. Sh- they were exploiting this shit all over the place. Fucking Beignets' wife writes her tell-all mem- memoir. My time behind bars. How I helped Czechoslovakia form through my own personal suffering. Gavrilo Princip died in prison of tuberculosis in 1918. One last question: Why haven't you heard about this? Well, that's actually very simple. The Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia in 1939, occupied the Czech part, and handed over Slovakia to a fascist collaborator government. All Czech history was suppressed to further the Germanization of Bohemia. The communists got elected into power in a restored Czechoslovakia after World War II, and after they changed the electoral system to make sure they would win every subsequent election, they suppressed this particular piece of history on the grounds that having it be part of their national myth would piss off the Soviet Union. So it only became an acceptable topic to talk about after the end of the Cold War, when Czechia and Slovakia finally split for good after decades of Slovak pushes for autonomy. And with these kinds of things, records get harder and harder to find over time. So there you have it. When you look at a map and see a couple of countries you only associate with beer and porn, remember that every single spot on this earth is the sum of millennia of the most intense shit you can possibly imagine. I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. If you'd like to find me online, you can do so at heydavebaker.com. 
or on the socials at xdavebakerx. Please pre-order my book, Mary Tyler Moorhawk, which is available from Top Shelf Comics. Uh, you can buy it wherever you want, Target, Amazon, Golden Apple Comics. You can get it all over the place. Um, it's a kind of like it's a half novel, half comic, and it's kind of like House of Leaves meets Buckaroo Banzai. So if that sounds like something that's up your alley, please go check it out. Spandrew, where can find where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on my armored battle train trekking across the country, just gunning my enemies down with a with a Gatlin gun mounted to the top like a like a fucking badass. And you, you can't find me on social media because I don't use social media, but if you want to pay your respects to the dear beloved Papa Pricey, you can get his book, Dead Bull AI Private Eye, by going to dapricerights.com and picking that up. You can follow us on social media, on Facebook, Deep Cuts Podcast. Join the Facebook group, Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, where we talk about the show and make memes. We can You can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Discord, where we talk about the show, make memes, play games, and other things. You can uh, follow us on, on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our website, deepcutspod.com. Click on the shop where you can get hats, T-shirts, and other ephemera. Um, And, uh, you know, uh, this has been mentioned a couple of times, but this this series about the uh, formation of Czechoslovakia was written by guest writer Louis Paggi, um, who clearly spent a a, a ton of time and work and research in crafting this series. Um, it's obviously very, uh, very well written and very well researched. And um, I hope you like this. And, you know, in addition to just, you know, shouting out Lewis, I just wanted to say, you know, I don't think we've ever really talked about this before on the show. Um, and very few of this, I think we'll probably hear this because not, not a whole lot of you listen to these outros. But, you know, I, I, I think that the thing that Dave and I like to do with this show is try different things. Um, we have, we've experimented with a lot of different formats and types of episodes from like a subject topicality standpoint. So, you know, the, the idea here is, I mean, really the idea here is that the show is just whatever we want it to be. And we just kind of follow our own whims of trying to have fun, um, and not getting locked into something. Um, but the other, the, 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 the secondary aspect of that is that we are trying to create a show that, um, doesn't get locked into uh, you know, a repetitive format to the point where you just ultimately get tired of the way that we do the show. Um, we really like to just like vary it up and explore different ways of both making the show and also the types of episodes we do. So all that to say, you know, this was obviously pretty different than a lot of episodes we've done. We haven't really done many like this, sort of like very straightforward historical um, document documenting of like a, an event without a whole lot of like, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of like spin to this. There wasn't really like a psychological element. It was just kind of like a historical oral history of something. So, you know, let, let us know if, if you like this episode and if you would like to hear more things like this in the future. Um, and yeah, and if, and if you are interested in, uh, possibly writing a guest episode of deep cuts, uh, and, uh, you can email Andrew at boygeniusmedia.com. Uh, we still haven't created the our, my Spandrew account, so I'm just using Andrew's account. Um, I think Dave secretly wants me to because it's some weird psychological hangup he has. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're interested in writing for the show, and, uh, email Andrew at, at boygeniusmedia.com, and um, we can start talking about that. You know, if you have ideas for uh, topics you'd like to write about, or if maybe you'd be interested in us t- telling you about a topic we already kind of have on our list. Um, and we can kind of go from there. We've had a, we've had pretty good luck with this so far. We've had maybe four, five, six different guest writers. I feel like pretty much all of them have gone really well. Um, you know, the 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 Pit My Ride episode, the Mister Rogers episode that I co-wrote with Jay Bard, um, the, uh, the the SCP and this Czechoslovakia episode that Lewis wrote, um, the George Harriman episode. Um, yeah. The, oh, yeah. The Boston um, Molasses Massacre episode. Um, so, it, you know, if you heard those episodes and didn't realize that they were guest written, um, you can guess written, write an episode, too. So email us. This episode was written by special guest writer Louis Paggi. 
If you'd be interested in writing an episode of Deep Cuts, email us at andrew at boygeniusmedia.com. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com.